Christmas is actually a pagan holiday. It, 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 I still have my Christmas tree. I still like presents and everything. But I also have knowledge and understanding. You know who I am. Some people, you know, take it so far they don't have Christmas trees and stuff. Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. <laughs> so bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> and I understand it. Amen. And then we come around and we'll have our feast. That because he wasn't even born on on December twenty fifth. That that's okay. And so Constantine instituted Jesus' birth December twenty fifth. He wasn't born on December twenty fifth, but I still like having presents on that day. You know, I came from heathen, heathen. Randy's from five generations of preachers. I'm from five generations of heathen. Christmas is actually a pagan holiday. It, 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 I still have my Christmas tree. I still like presents and everything. But I also have knowledge and understanding. Christmas is really a pagan holiday, guys. It's not Jesus' real birthday, although I still celebrate it. So bring me a gift on Christmas. It's okay. <laughs> Um, and I still put up a Christmas tree, so it is, it is what it is, right? Christmas is really a pagan holiday, guys. It's not Jesus' real birthday, although I still celebrate it. So bring me a gift on Christmas. It's okay. <laughs> Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. And so Constantine instituted Jesus' birth December 25th. He wasn't born on December 25th, but I still like having presents on that day. Christmas is actually a pagan holiday. That I still have my Christmas tree. I still like presents and everything. But I also have knowledge and understanding. You know who I am. Some people, you know, take it so far they don't have Christmas trees and stuff. Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. <laughs> so bring me presents at Christmas, and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> Besetting sins are not common sins of neglect or rebellion where God says thou shalt not and you say I'm going to do it anyway. Every time you willingly sin, you trample the blood of Jesus and crucify him over again. The book of Hebrews says where God says thou shalt not and you say I'm going to do it anyway. Besetting sins are not common sins. A besetting sin is not a common sin, which a common sin means a sin of neglect. So if God says, it is my will, and you say no to that, and you say what, if God says, thus saith the Lord, this is the will of God, clearly renown this word, and you say no to that, then that is rebellion. That means you're doing what, your thing, you're doing what you want to. So thou shall not, and the person says, I will. That's a called a common sin. You know who I am. Some people, you know, take it so far they don't have Christmas trees and stuff. Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. <laughs> so bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. I need to cast out some spirits of rebellion already. There are so many wonderful Christmas stories throughout the Word of God and prophetic insights, majestic moments, unfathomable love, details to describe about Matthew 1 and the birth of our Savior surrounding Christ coming forth, what we call Christmas.
Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 through 28. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of your Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day and go after other gods which you have not known. There's not a curse without a cause. The main two causes of any kind of generational curse is idolatry and disobedience. Main two ones, idolatry and disobedience. Exodus chapter 20 verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down to them, talking about idols, nor serve them, other gods. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. And I visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. The main two causes of any kind of generational curse is idolatry and disobedience. Christmas is really a pagan holiday, guys. It's not Jesus' real birthday, although I still celebrate it. Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. So bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> when you know better and choose not to do better anyway, then you say, why is my life going wrong? You better slap your own self. I mean, you better just knock your own self out because you can't blame the devil. You've got to say, I'm blaming myself because I just chose to disobey God. and you are from like me a lineage of heathen and if you look back over your lineage and there was nothing but a bunch of heathen and sin of your ancestral forefathers and biblically and in every other way those laws and the sins of your forefathers should be visiting me and I should be passing them to my children but because of the blood of Jesus it can be broken tonight and every generational curse has to come off you Anything that is not in alignment with God's word is a spirit of antichrist working in your life. And to whom much is given, much is required. When you have revelation and know to do right and do it that not, the Bible calls it sin. Joshua chapter 24, we've got 20 minutes. Let me hear it. It says verse 15. And if it seem evil, which means grievous, miserable, and troublesome, and adverse unto you to serve, which means to work, service, and worship the Lord, choose. Look at somebody say, choose. All right. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Every single day, I bring some kind of alignment in my life. Because there's agreement either with hell or there's agreement with heaven. There's agreement with light or there's agreement with darkness. There's agreement with cursing or there's agreement with blessing. That's why God told you, you choose. It's not going to choose you. You choose it. The book of Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 5, verse 15, and verse 16. Let's read the word of the Lord corporately and in concert. Titus, verse 5. Let me hear you. For this cause left I thee in Christ, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Verse 15 and 16. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Mm. Set it in order. They profess that they know God, that they perceive him, understand him. But in works, they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work, worthless. They profess that they know God, that they perceive him, understand him. 
Christmas is actually a pagan holiday. It, 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 I still have my Christmas tree. I still like presents and everything. But I also have knowledge and understanding. So bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> but in works, they deny him being abominable and disobedient. Psalm chapter 2 8 says ask of me and I will give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession I've heard God laugh. God's got a sense of humor. Right? Oh, let me let me talk to you. Let's bring it down to New Testament. All right. If a brother or a sister acts up in the church, we are to bring to correction to one another. Okay, if they bring division among the church, not not weakness, wickedness. Okay, if there's if there is deliberate wickedness, you're to bring corrections. If a person's non-repentive, if there's no remorse, because there's a difference between weakness and wickedness. The difference is if I deliberately rebel against God. There's a difference between a weakness and a wickedness. Are you with me? Because wickedness just means, I don't care what you say, God, I'm going to do this my way. I really don't care what you do, whatever, this is how it's going to be. So wickedness means that there is something in you that is completely rebellious towards the nature of God. And it needs to be drawn out of you, <laughs> cast out in Jesus' name. Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. <laughs> so bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> Christmas is really a pagan holiday, guys. It's not Jesus' real birthday, although I still celebrate it. So bring me a gift on Christmas. It's okay. Um, and I still put up a Christmas tree, so it is, it is what it is, right? Oh, let me, let me talk to you. Let's bring it down to New Testament. All right. If a brother or a sister acts up in the church, we are to bring to correction to one another. Okay. If they bring division among the church, not, not weakness, wickedness. Okay. If, there's, if there is deliberate wickedness, you're to bring correction. Now, if they don't receive that correction, now I'm not talking about a personal believer that's got an offense. You're to go to them if they don't receive that. According to Matthew 18, you take a brother. If they don't receive that, you take it to the elders. If they don't receive the counsel of that, then you take it to the highest order. Then you turn them out and you kick them out of the church. That's why God starts with repentance. If a person's non-repentive, if there's no remorse, because there's a difference between weakness and wickedness. Now, if they don't receive that correction, now I'm not talking about a personal believer that's got an offense. You're to go to them if they don't receive that. According to Matthew 18, you take a brother. If they don't receive that, you take it to the elders. If they don't receive the counsel of that, then you take it to the highest order. Then you turn them out and you kick them out of the church. Because God wants to deal with you first and foremost in your heart. He wants to deal with you spiritually. And then that will change everything on the outside. Because when the internal gets fixed, the outside changes. When the word gets on the inside of you, it's like right now, if this building was dark, if we came in and flipped the light switch on, the light would dispel the darkness. So when the light, flip, when the light switch gets flipped on in you, whatever's dark in you gets out of you. When the, the light of God's word which is the entry point come on this is the entry point when the light of God's word gets in you all the darkness gets out of you
many of you like birthdays? I'm a birthday person. I love birthday. It's holidays, right? I love birthdays and Christmas. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. I'm a, I'm a big kid. You know, we don't change because we don't want to change. I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> Come on, I'm going to, we don't change because we don't want to change. Desire. So desire is needed. You have to have a desire to change. The second thing is intention. You have to be purposeful about it. You have to have an intention. Change doesn't just happen. Nothing just falls out of the sky. You have to be very intentional about it. You have to be calculated. Your whole life should be mapped out for the purpose of God. So bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> God's going to be all hooked up in your business. Hooked up. Stop trying to relegate God to just the places that you want His presence. Don't act like God can only be the God over this part of your life. He's Lord over all or He's not Lord at all. How can you preach something and not live it? The truth is not relative to your situation. Truth is not relative to your circumstance. Truth is relative to this Word of God. The moment you get away from the Word of God is the moment that we get messed up as a people because He is the truth. This is the way. This I don't care if no one's doing it. I don't care if I'm off. I don't care if you're off. Right is right if no one's doing it and wrong is wrong if everyone is doing it. There is no gray. This is the word. This is the truth. This is the life. This is the uncompromised, infallible word of God. And listen, if we're over here, it is still center. It does not mean I can move the word of God in favor of how I want to live with my lifestyle. It means I've got to either stay over here and face the consequences for being out of alignment, or I've got to do a directional change and turn and get back in divine alignment with God's word, God's will, in God's way. How can you preach something and not live it? Christmas is a time of establishing and celebrating many traditions. And I want to take time to teach you the value of setting traditions for your family. Many of you know one of our greatest family traditions that we so look forward to. We're like, I mean, our children are grown. My youngest is 20. We have three grandchildren, but still we run into the family room where the Christmas tree is into this very room right here. It is our family tradition. When you begin to create traditions, and I think there's not a better time than holiday traditions. The number one holiday that we create traditions that help us stay connected is Christmas time. You can do it all the time. Create a tradition. Like what, Paula? Oh, bake cookies together. Every single year, maybe you build a gingerbread house together and you eat it on Christmas Day. But don't forget to always remember that somewhere in that your children are emulating not what you say, but what they see you do. How do they see your faith in action? Create a tradition that shows forth not just what you say about God, but what you really believe about God. Christmas is a time of establishing and celebrating many traditions. And I wanna take time to teach you the value of setting traditions for your family. And so here, here's the only thing that makes the word of God of non-effect. The devil can't stop the word of God. The enemy can't do it, Brad. A principality cannot stop the word of God. Can't do it. And that's a strong governing demonic force. Can't stop the word of God. The only thing that makes the word of God of no effect is the traditions of men. Traditions. Create them for your family. And I want to take time to teach you the value of setting traditions for your family.
Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26 through 28. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a cursing, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you to go after other gods which you've not known. So here's the two main reasons that people have cursing. There's a root, and I'll get to that today. There's a root. There's not ever a curse without a cause. Two main reasons, idolatry and disobedience. It's found in this verse. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, talking about other gods. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. There's not ever a curse without a cause. Two main reasons, idolatry and disobedience. Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. So bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> Christmas trees are pagan, but I still like them. <laughs> so bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> Christmas is a time of establishing and celebrating many traditions. And I want to take time to teach you the value of setting traditions for your family. Traditions. Create them for your family. There's not ever a curse without a cause. Two main reasons, idolatry and disobedience. Rebellion. The Bible here says that rebellion is as the spirit of witchcraft. It compares rebellion to witchcraft because rebellion is a conscious, open, intentional, blatant disregard for God. It's not a mistake. It's not an accident. If not, I forgot what God told me to do. I openly rebelled. I went in the opposite direction of my own volition. Rebellion is as a spirit of witchcraft. You'd be surprised how people try to use God's power to manipulate things the way they want them to go. They use their position, they use anything they can to manipulate, and this is the correlation between witchcraft, because witchcraft is purely manipulation. Anytime you try to infringe your will over on somebody else to make them do what you think they ought to do, you're a witch. And there are witches in the pulpits all over America. Oh yes, there are. There are witches in the pulpit all over America who don't get up in the morning saying, Lord, what would you have me to do? They're just sitting up trying to figure out how they can manipulate the congregation another Sunday. Witches all over the pulpit. There are spiritual mothers who are nothing but witches just trying to control and dominate and influence people to make them do whatever they want them to do. Anybody who's trying to move you away from God's will or away from God's purpose for their own agenda is a witch. No matter how nice they are, no matter how many scriptures they quote, no matter what they wear, no matter what, how they're related to you, it's a witch. The spirit of witchcraft has attacked the church, ultimately led to Samuel's, to Saul's demise. He ends up consulting the witches because he has a spirit of rebellion. He is a witch. Saul's rebellion caused him to die. Is there, is there, is there possibly any place in your life where rebellion might be the sword that would kill you. As a believer, you are God's law enforcement agent here on the earth. You enforce the law for God. Because rebellion is a conscious, open, intentional, blatant disregard for God. It's not a mistake. It's not an accident. If not, I forgot what God told me to do. I openly rebelled. I went in the opposite direction of my own volition. Christmas is actually a pagan holiday. It, 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 I still have my Christmas tree. I still like presents and everything. But I also have knowledge and understanding. So bring me presents at Christmas and I'm putting up a tree. <laughs> And the problem we have today, the curse of our generation is absentee fathers. We don't have fathers in houses and we don't have fathers in churches. We got a lot of pastors getting paychecks. 
But a father will look at you and tell you, sit down. We don't have fathers in houses and we don't have fathers in churches. The problem with the church today is we have a deficit of men of God. Let the show begin. Rick Hawkins is a showman. And I release destiny in your life. A charismatic and powerful preacher saving souls in the name of the Lord. Do everything God said you're going to do. But Rick Hawkins is also a preacher with a problem. Hundreds of followers have made a mass exodus, leaving his family praise center church recently because of word that Hawkins has been caught up in a sex scandal. Did he come on to you in any other ways? This woman says she was victimized by Hawkins' sexual advances. She's asked us not to show her face, use her name, and to alter her voice. She doesn't go to Hawkins' church anymore because of something she says happened when she turned to her pastor for counseling for a personal matter. But instead of comforting her, she says Hawkins hit on her during a phone conversation, even though he knew she was married. He first mentioned to me that he was in bed naked, and it caught me off guard. She says Hawkins' inappropriate comments went even further. He asked if I would like to have phone sex, and he also asked me questions about me masturbating. And when he was asking you all this, what were you thinking? I was very confused. I was frustrated and hurt. And she says she was hurt even more when she spoke to other women who also claimed they were the target of sexual advances by Hawkins. In fact, we've confirmed that Hawkins had several extramarital affairs before he and his wife divorced last February. One of those affairs recently resulted in the divorce between two married employees at his church. We've also learned Hawkins has used thousands of dollars in church funds, money put in the collection plate, to silence many of those affected by his sexual advances. In exchange for the money, they agree not to talk about what happened. We don't have fathers in houses, and we don't have fathers in churches. The problem with the church today is we have a deficit of men of God. wise men coming and the gifts that they brought. Uh, there were so many different aspects that we could tackle this Christmas day. And as I was praying and studying and fasting, the Lord said, go back to the simplicity of Christmas, that it is simply about Christ. Christmas is really a pagan holiday, guys. It's not Jesus's real birthday. You know, we, are, we know that Easter really is a pagan terminology. You know, I still celebrate Christmas. Uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. Um, you know, it, it's all good. It's okay. You're not going to go to hell because you have a little bunny bring an egg in a basket. It's, I promise it's okay. Somebody look at your neighbor say, chill out. It's okay. Well, I still celebrate Christmas. Uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. Um, you know, it, it's all good. It's okay. You're not going to go to hell because you have a little bunny bring an egg in a basket. It's, I promise it's okay. Somebody look at your neighbor say, chill out. It's okay. There are things that excite God. There are things that make God really mad. I mean, there are things that tick God off. Sincerely, there are things that God will just... I still celebrate Christmas. Uh, we'll have an Easter egg hunt. Um, you know, it, it's all good. It's okay. You're not going to go to hell because you have a little bunny bring an egg in a basket. It's, I promise it's okay. Somebody look at your neighbor say, chill out. It's okay.
For years I've heard of Bishop Duncan, Bishop Nicholas Duncan Williams, Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams. I had the privilege to be a part of the opening of the Potter's House and I remember it clearly. I was asked to read, to give the official with all the senates and everyone to read the New Testament reading for the official opening of the Potter's House. And I remember Carlin Pearson was doing Old Testament and Bishop Noel Jones moderated. And Bishop, Archbishop Duncan Williams was asked to pray the dedication of prayer. When he opened his mouth and began to pray, the potter's house began to shake with the fragrance of the anointing. I only heard prayers like that when I was growing up. He prayed, call the spirit of Astaroth and other names I didn't even know was in the Bible until I started reading it. We shouted for about an hour. We could care less who was there, what Senate was there, and the anointing came in the house. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so blessed to have him tonight. He's in great demand. God is on his life. He has been a spiritual impartation to me, and I love him and I always will love him. Ruach Ministries and Friends, put your hands together for Archbishop Nicholas. Duncan! William! My covering to Archbishop Duncan Williams and Bishop T.D. Jakes, God knew that I needed a strong man's man of authority that was sure of who they were to be able to speak into my life and I could go, yes, sir. on Good Friday, but he descended to hell. He took the captives of death, hell, and the grave. He gave you and I dominion. And on that third day, on this Easter resurrection morning, he got up so you could get up. Whatever it is that the enemies tried to hold you back with, or would bind you, you're going to leave here this resurrection Sunday different than any other resurrection Sunday. is not here for he is risen on easter sunday march 23rd join the without walls international church family as we celebrate the resurrection of jesus christ bishop randy will be ministering an anointed message that will change your life our sunrise service will begin at 6 30 a.m so plan now to celebrate his resurrection with us at without walls international church easter sunday march 23rd he is risen It's not simply about Passover. It's the principles of God that must function fully in your life. During this time of the year when we celebrate Easter and the Passover season, we reflect on the events that led up to the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection.
And I know this, most people don't give out a need. It's not a need we have, it's something that we're doing. And when you stand before the Lord and the souls that were saved and the lives that were transformed because New Destiny Christian Center decided to give the devil a black eye on his night and instead we bring God's glory forth and we have hallelujah night, we don't have Halloween, don't make me get into teaching you about Halloween. And we break that spirit because this land is redeemed so we glorify God. There'll be much ministry, much deliverance going on. It's not just a night of fun, but you'd say, Pastor Paul, I want to make a difference. Everybody, bring Bring that offering. Come on, you are light or you're darkness. You're being used by God or you're being used by the enemy. You're either on God's agenda or you're on the devil's agenda. There's really not any gray ground in this thing. You are for God. We taught it before. Or you are against God. I want you to take a look at the video and see what you made happen at your church and through this ministry. so very much. Look what you have made happen tonight. I'm standing in line with the kids getting their candy. We're getting ready to go over the rides. There's food. There's fun. It is our hallelujah night. We're giving away candy. You can bring the rides. Everybody's eating. We've got all kinds of Italian sausage, hamburgers, hot dogs. It's happening here at hallelujah night. And that's because New Destiny, you made it happen. gets mixed with the world. Come on, nobody wants to talk about it, but we have to talk about it because when we get mixed with the world and take a little bit of their system ways of doing things and a little bit of the Word of God, then we're intermingling and God hates mixture. He said, you can't mix my ways with the world's ways. We've got to raise up a standard of excellence. There has to be glory. God's going to be priority for everything. There'll be no compromise. There'll be no standard that is less. We don't, we're in the world, but we're not like this world. We're going to be different. We're going to be set apart. We're sanctified people. We are the church of the living God. How can you preach something and not live it? I want to live it. It's more than learning scripture. It's living scripture. Every single day I bring some kind of alignment in my life. Because there's agreement either with hell or there's agreement with heaven. There's agreement with light or there's agreement with darkness. New Destiny Christian Center just want you to know that you are our Valentine. We have, we have a few things for you. We have uh, two dozen of long stem roses because you deserve more than one dozen. So you have two dozen. Pastor Paula. On behalf of the leadership, the board, and all the New Destiny Christian Center family, I want you to take this box yes, and let me tell you what's inside. Yes, ma'am. You have a gift certificate for one-day spa package at Ritz-Carlton. You also have a gift certificate dinner for two at Victoria Albert Restaurant at Disney. Woo! You have a box of chocolates. We even flew in a guy from California, he in that box too. Oh. And, <laughs> I'm like, oh Lord, my husband's in the box. <laughs> and we want you to let him out on Valentine's Day. He'll keep, there's a hole right there in the top. This is a card, it's fresh, I love. 
You can open. Fraser, here's your two dozen long stem roses. And we just want to say that we love you. We love you. And I want y'all to know that the Lord has done a mighty work through this soldier in just a month and a half. He's done a miraculous work. Let's give our pastor a good God blessing. Happy Valentine's Day, Pastor Paula. And all you men, make sure you send your ladies something nice, amen? Because it, it just, it can be 20 years, you'll still, you'll melt her. She'll change just like that. She'll be like, oh baby, what you want? Just anything. But many people think Thanksgiving, and I did some research today, is it was a holiday. The civil holiday was from Plymouth, but it really started as a religious holiday. And Thanksgiving um, uh, was basically a prayers of thanks and special Thanksgiving ceremonies um, because of religious harvest times. And it was rooted in English traditions dating from the Protestant Reformation. And basically, they would have a harvest festival, even through the harvest in New England. And what they began to do when the Reformation, the Protestant movement came forth, they decided that every time that God blessed them, they would have a day of thanksgiving. And so they would call during judgment days of fasting. And then for special blessings that they viewed as coming from God, they called that days of thanksgiving. And they went through all the different dates and things. So for every day of thanksgiving, they would have a holiday and a celebration. But many people think Thanksgiving, and I did some research today, is it was a holiday. The civil holiday was from Plymouth, but it really started as a religious holiday. And it was rooted in English traditions. The only thing that makes the Word of God of no effect is the traditions of men. And I want to take time to teach you the value of setting traditions for your family. Traditions. Create them for your family. And I came to let everyone, and the mama, and the papa, and the enemies, and their friends, and their in-laws know this little woman of God believes one thing. I'm declaring war on the traditions of men. And I want to take time to teach you the value of setting traditions for your family. Traditions. Create them for your family. But many people think Thanksgiving, and I did some research today, and it was rooted in English traditions. But God says, I have come to break the traditions of men, which make the word of God of non-effect. And Thanksgiving um, uh, was basically a prayers of thanks and special Thanksgiving ceremonies um, because of religious harvest times. And it was rooted in English traditions, basically of prayers of thanks and special Thanksgiving ceremonies. And then we're going to have a beautiful time of finishing out the service with candlelight and singing some hymns and just having a wonderful community family time. The way we do this is the honor guards are going to light the person on the end. So like Avina, they're going to light your candle. And then you're going to light TC's candle. And TC's going to light Ryan. And then when we all have them lit, we're going to dim all the lights, and we're going to sing. We're going to worship God for about five, seven minutes, and we're just going to sing in gratitude. And I just want you to reflect over the goodness of God. And the reason we do this is because it shows that we are one. We are the light of Christ. Go ahead and dim the lights. Go ahead. Somebody got to light our candle up here on stage. Pastor David, you got your candle? You got to sing with candle. Somebody come light my candle. <laughs> Thank you, Duma. Hold it up. You're the light of the world.
Let's give all the mothers in the house a hand. Praise God. We have a special gift for you. Amen. Glory to God. Well, we have one more mother that we want to recognize. She is the spiritual mother of this house. I want everyone to stand. Not only is she our spiritual mother, but she is our pastor. Thank God for a pastor. Every sheep needs a pastor. And we got one of the best. Pastor Paula White. Amen. Amen. Give it up. Give it up. Dr. Wanda said rightly. Dr. Wanda said rightly. We have one of the best pastors. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Pastor Paula, we want to honor you today. This happy Mother's Day. We can say we are so thrilled, so blessed, so happy to have a spiritual mother that we can learn from. You are an example. Um, even your past experience, what God has placed inside of you that you can teach us and lead us, that does not come lightly. And we do not take the gift that God has sent lightly. We want to demonstrate that we love you. We want to demonstrate that we have your back. We want to demonstrate that even if God has sent you to us, but God gave us to you, and we will do our part. Hallelujah. Thank God for her. Turn around and give somebody a hug. Say, this one's from Pastor Paula. Say, thank you, thank you. How many of you like birthdays? I'm a birthday person. I love birthday. It's holidays, right? And um, I think Elder and them want me to be quiet for a minute. I see flowers and balloons. Uh-oh. <laughs> Amen. Not only did you best the great church, but we have a great pastor. Pastor Paula White. Glory, glory. <laughs> Just a few flowers, just, just to let you know how much we love you. Uh, just a few balloons as well, just to let you know how much we love you. Matter of fact, you may be seated for right now anyway. Just a few things. We have a couple of videos we'd like to just show uh, the audience. Some individuals just want to acknowledge Pastor Paul the White birthday. So if you just watch the screen, we have a couple of videos for you. Greetings in the invincible name of Jesus Christ. I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, the senior pastor of the Potter's House right here in Dallas, Texas. And I wanted to take this moment on Pastor Paula's birthday to appreciate you and to honor you, woman of God, for your tremendous contribution to the body of Christ. Pastor Paula White, your entrance into the world has made it better. And we thank God for you. Got my mic up all messed up. <laughs> right before you bring your cars, I'm going to just let you know, after the 1130 service, we will be celebrating. We will be having a party, a Christian party. Praise the Lord. Uh, next Sunday, November 4th, the first Sunday, is we're having a pastor appreciation because we got one of the most awesomest pastors on this side of 
Orlando, Florida, United States. Oh, you can do better than that. Glory to God. This woman is a seasoned woman of God. She is a prophet, apostle. Glory to God. And we get to hear her every Sunday. Millions go around. They can't get what we get. But glory to God, we just get everything. Hallelujah. We're going to appreciate our pastor. Our pastor. Pastor Paula White on next Sunday, November 4th. Honor guards, you have cards. We have cards. Our pastor loves to read cards. She like birthday cards, birthday present cards. Uh, so we're going to supply you a card. We want you to supply the words. It's the card. The card is empty. Please put something inside your card. Beside just your words. Do I need to interpret those tongues? So pastor's going to be opening in cards like this, and we want to see some checks falling out, some dollar bills. <laughs> Glory! First John chapter 3 verse 10 says no one who does not practice righteousness who does not conform to God's will and purpose thought and action is of God rut row look at your neighbor say buckle in we're almost finished that one got weak right there ready first John chapter 3 verse 10 no one how many people guys who does not do what now remember, we already studied what practice is, right? Practice means to carry out and to apply. So no one who does not what? Practice righteousness. Now here's what righteousness is. It's the amplified version. Who does not conform to God's will in purpose, in thought, and action is of God. No one who does not practice the righteousness, that is to conform to God's will and purpose, thought, and action, is of God. So I can say all day long, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God, I'm heir with God, I'm enjoying heir with Jesus Christ, I'm the master of the most high God. I can say it all night long. But this Bible is a mirror. It's an accurate reflection that shows me. So now I look at my life and I say, do I practice his purpose? What's the purpose of God? Do I practice his thoughts? And do I practice his actions? Because if I don't practice his purpose, if I don't practice his thoughts, and I don't practice his actions, then it says I'm not of God. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. Now this is serious stuff because God's making a vow. He says, I call heaven and earth this day to record against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. God's plan for the earth was established in and by his will. That's why anytime you say anything that is outside of the word of God, it's not the will of God. That's how you will derail your life, is getting outside. The word of God is the will of God for your life. Anything not backed by the word of God, it is not God. I'm teaching you good right now. This is the infallible word of God. You have to know the word with revelation, with eyes to see. We've got to get back to knowing the Bible, what God has to to say he's more concerned about your heart than he is your house the blessing in my life is that God loved me enough to allow me to be stripped to allow me to be reduced to Christ to allow me to die to anything that was not of him hey! Woo! now 
we can do a job for Jesus. Anything that is not in alignment with God's Word is a spirit of Antichrist working in your life. We've turned everyone to what way, guys? Which way did we turn? Read it. His own way. That is the problem. God says, I have my way and you have your way. And here's the universal problem is that you have become your own God. You think that you can pick and choose scripture and do it the way you want to do it instead of doing it the way God says. This is not selective. This is not multiple choice. This is not a buffet. This is not Burger King. Have it your way. This is the word of God and God clearly lays out through his word everything for our life everything for our relationships everything for our conduct come on everything for our spirit everything for our mind and here's the universal problem is that you have become your own God you think that you can pick and choose scripture stop trying to relegate God to just the places that you want his presence Don't act like God can only be the God over this part of your life. He's Lord over all or he's not Lord at all. Partial obedience is disobedience. Because God's not going to sit here and say, Chuck, I'm going to speak to you. But I am not going to speak to Bob. I'm going to speak over here to you, Harry. But I'm not going to talk to you over here, Sylvia. God's not going to do that. If you open up, God's going to give us all the same instruction, the same word, the same opportunity, and the same voice. He says, he said, listen, I'm not going to change my principle because you have a rebellious spirit that wants me to fit into your agenda. You're going to have to do this my way. And so what I'm really doing uncovering in you, Cain, is that and he says those that have the Cain nature have an evil nature. This is what the word of God says in, in 1 John here. He says who took on the nature of the evil one, which means they wanted to do it their own way because they had a carnal that said, God, you be my God and do it how I want you to do it. He said, I want your obedience. And you've got to decide for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So a lot of people talk a good game. Know anybody that can talk some smack? I know people that can talk game, but there's an old saying that says this, walk it like you talk it. Don't talk the talk unless you can walk the walk. So, so it is the honoring of Jesus Christ as the Lordship, as the highest priority of your life. Listen, I know that I know I'm not ministry material, but I'm God material. I know that I 
understand because it was through the brokenness and through the stripping away and through the utter of, of, of dying to carnality and flesh that God says, now, Paula, you're usable. It's kind of like fine flour. Fine flour doesn't become fine flour. It has to go through a process of being stripped. And so when wheat gets ready to be used as that oblation, which is something that is worthy of worship to be offered unto the Lord, it says it's mingled with oil, but before the anointing comes, you have to go through the process of being fine flour. And so fine flour is wheat and tear stand up together. But wheat takes a different disposition because it bows down. There are some that are going to be in the church standing up like this because they're full of themselves. But there are others that are going to be bent down before the Lord. Wheat and tear stand up together, but wheat takes a different disposition because it bows down. There are some that are going to be in the church standing up like this because they're full of themselves. You've got to see how God sees things. Remember when I can take you from beginning to end. Why does God do some of the things he does? I mean, we, let, we all use Saul and David, right? Saul has a perfect resume. He seems like he should be the one perfectly qualified, but he, he's not. In the eyes of God, he is full of himself. Not doing what God tells you is far worse than fooling around in the occult. Getting self-important around God is far worse than making deals with your dead ancestors. Because you said no to God's command, he says no to your kingship. So let me just break this down. You're used to the King James Version. It says to obey is better than to sacrifice. And disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft and idolatry. But what it's saying is it's worse than fooling around with the cult and you consulting your dead ancestors and bringing them back. And he said because you didn't listen to God, you, he said now because you said no to God's command, God says no to your kingship. You wonder why you can't advance in life. Because when God says no, God means no. And if you go on to find out, and I read it all the way down, it says God means what he says and says what he means. He doesn't mince his words. You're dealing with a real devil who really does hate you and wants to kill, steal, and destroy. You are either gather or you are scatter. Come on, you are light or you're darkness. You're being used by God or you're being used by the enemy. You're either on God's agenda or you're on the devil's agenda. There's really not any gray ground in this thing. You are for God. We taught it before. Or you are against God. This is so good because we got to separate the saints from the ain'ts. You know, I came from heathen, heathen. Randy's from five generations of preachers. I'm from five generations of heathen.